Hi, welcome to the services of the Central New Hampshire Seventh-day Adventist Churches. I'm Pastor Cliff Gleason, and I'm the pastor of the Concord Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Laconia Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we're taping here today in the Laconia Church because of the COVID crisis, but we're glad you can tune in and we can get to share the Word of God and study it together. Let's ask the Lord's blessing for our study today. Our loving Father, we're so thankful that you are a God who loves people and you love to speak into our hearts and minds with a beautiful message of your love and salvation. You're always reaching down after us. We appreciate that you take the initiative all the time and in every way. And we're thankful for the blessings that are ours as we walk with you and live with you and open up to you as we take your word and open it and look into it to find treasures, special gems that reveal to us more of your love and goodness. Guide us now, we pray. May the Holy Spirit be with each one, no matter where each one is, whether at home or at church or at work or in the car, wherever they may be. We know that you can see us all and know us all and love us all. So reach us anew today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're looking again in the book of Philippians, one of Paul's letters that he wrote from prison. We've come up to chapter 4 now, and we're going to be learning about reward and prayer and contentment. So let's dive right in. We come to chapter 4 and verse 1. And I'm going to be reading mainly from the Passion Translation. Sometimes I'll be bringing up the Amplified Version. But you'll see on the screen those verses that relate to that. So in the Passion Translation, chapter 4 of Philippians, verse 1. And it reads this way. My dear and precious friends, whom I deeply love. You have truly become my glorious joy and crown of my reward. Now arise in the fullness of your union with our Lord. Now in this passage, let's notice a couple of things. One is he says that you have become, and he's talking about the believers there in Philippi, the church members, people that Paul had worked with and studied with and fellowshiped with. He says, you have truly become my glorious joy and crown of reward. People were important to Paul because people are important to God. Notice he says it's the people that are his reward. We saw when we were studying the book of Ephesians, looking in chapter 1, that we, the people who know and trust God, are God's inheritance. We are what he's looking forward to enjoying forever. People are important to God. Now, for a pastor, our reward is not the, the uh, salaries that we make or the retirement that we earn or uh, the opportunities to live in different places. Our reward is seeing the people that we minister to grow spiritually and become stronger and stronger followers of Christ and enjoy the fulfillment that comes with being God's people. That's our reward. It's in the people. And what about for church members? Do they have a reward? Well, yes, because they're serving. Church members serve. They serve other members. They serve people in the community. They serve neighbors, even family. And all the people touched by their lives are their reward. Seeing good things happen. Seeing the the effectiveness of our service in the lives and hearts and, and minds of the people that we're serving. And then, of course, there are officers in the church, the elders, the deacons, the deaconesses, the Sabbath school teachers. Their service uh, results in rewards because the Sabbath school teachers, they see the students growing and learning and, and getting new insights into the Bible. And the elders and the deacons, as they visit, as they as they assist, 
they see that people are blessed, whether it's at the worship service or uh, other activities. So, to you who are followers of Christ, I want to say that you contribute to the hearts and lives of other people. You make a difference. You make a difference by God's blessing, his working in you and through you. And there's a reward with people, the people that we'll enjoy forever in God's eternal kingdom. Now let's go to chapter, uh, still in chapter four, but to verses two and three. And I plead with Yudia and with Sintiq that to settle their disagreement and to re be restored with one mind in our Lord. I would like my dear friend and burden bearer to help resolve this issue, for both women have diligently labored with me for the prize and helped in spreading the revelation of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers. All of their names are written in the book of life. Now, here he's talking about a dispute, and he's trying to offer some counsel and, in a sense, some correction, saying, let's get these people to settle the dispute, get back together, get reconciled. We, wonder, we might wonder, well, why are these people having a dispute? Why are they, uh, you know, aren't they, are they church members? Are they, are they people who are fighting? Are they uh, not very nice people? Well, they must be nice people. It says here that they've been co-workers with Paul. And did you see it? their names are written in the book of life. We say, how can it be? Book, their names written in the book of life and they're bickering and they're having this disagreement and all. Well, they're people, real people. And real people, we have weaknesses, we have faults, we have deficiencies. Some people have one kind, some have another. For some of us, we have no time for for church activities, no time for God, for the Bible. Some are timid. Oh, how can I do this? I can't be a leader. I can't be somebody uh, leading out in any way. Other people, uh, they're just overcommitted, overcommitted to their job or to their hobbies or to their family even. And, and there's no time left for God and his work and serving him. So we can have all kinds of weaknesses. But God has strength that is made perfect in weakness. We just have to bring our weaknesses to God. We have to admit that they're there. We have to face them squarely, say, Lord, this is a weakness. I, that I don't have any time for you. That's a weakness. That I'm overcommitted or that I'm too timid. I need, to, I need your help, Lord. And so we bring our weaknesses to God. And then when he strengthens us, to make changes, to do things differently, to serve him more effectively, he gets the glory because it wasn't us. It was him in us. So his strength is made perfect in weak people. And these ladies were weak. They needed some help. And so God wanted to help them. You see, because performance isn't the important thing to God, people are the important thing. They were messing up. They had disagreements. But they were important. And God says, let's help them. Let's get somebody who can get them back together. Well, let's go to verses 4 and 5 together. This time I'm going to read it in the message paraphrase. Celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him. Make it as clear as you can to all who meet you that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive. He could show up at any minute. Well, here he's trying to encourage us, if we're believing in God, if we're understanding in God's love, let's revel in it, let's really enjoy it, let's take it in and love this, this uh, understanding of God's goodness. And people will see the difference. They'll notice the peace. They'll notice the joy. They'll notice that, uh, that there's something different about followers of Christ who are taking this and have, enjoying this joy. And so it says, go with the people. Be on their side. Well, this is the way Jesus did it. 
This is just the way Jesus did it. If you're a believer in Jesus already, the thing we need to do is follow his example to go out and mingle among people. Jesus didn't sit home reading his Bible 24 hours a day. He didn't go to the synagogue and just pray all the time. He didn't just sit around uh, talking with his uh, friends and with uh, church leaders. No, he went out to where people were hurting, to where people were, were doing their everyday life, and he met with them, and he mingled with them, and he took an interest in what they were interested in. And because he did, people paid attention. People were drawn to him. And then he noticed where their needs were, and he came in and he served them at their point of need. That's something we can do. We need to pay attention. We need to, t to carve out some time from our busy lives to see where are their needs of the people around us, in the neighborhood, in the workplace, in the community. And how can we meet those needs? And God will help us with that. And once we've met their needs, people start to trust us. They start to ask about things. They want to hear what we have to say. And when we can share something, we can tell them our own story and what we've learned about Christ and how the difference that he's made in our lives. And people want to, to know that and they want to, to have that. And we can bid them follow them to Jesus. So once again, people are the important thing to God. Go to be with them. Go to serve them. Mingle with them. Win them. All right, let's go to number uh, six. Verse six. I'm back in the Passion Translation. It says, don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout the day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. Well, this is talking about the problem of worry. That happens to all of us in some form or another. Some people are a little more prone to it, others a little less. But everybody has worries at some point with something. Today a lot of people are having worries about health issues, the spread of the, uh, the virus and so on. The, also the problems with the economy, people problem problems with their jobs or with trying to accomplish things with businesses or agencies that are not so easily accessible. And that's a, that is a problem. But this says, have your day saturated with prayer. We can turn to God with everything all through the day. And it says to offer your faith-filled request. Now, isn't that an interesting uh, phrase? Your faith-filled requests. Now, we know about requests. You know, we all have things that we would like. We'd like a better job. We'd like a better home. We'd like to have a nice vacation. We'd like this or that. Well, or we'd like to uh, help other people. But is it, so that's request. But this is a particular kind of request. It's a faith-filled request. Now, how do we present our request to God as faith-filled requests? That's the, perhaps the big question here in this particular part of the chapter. Faith-filled requests. Well, it goes on. It says, Present faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. Don't miss that part. That's the key to the faith-filled request. A faith-filled request is a request that we make and we're happy, we're thankful, we're appreciative of the answer that's coming before we even see it. Before we even see it. So we ask for God for help with a certain thing, and we say, Lord, I'm putting it in your hands, and because of I know who you are and how dependable you are, how you have so many promises for, for us, and you fulfill those promises, I'm putting this in your hands, and thank you for the answer that you already have planned for me, and that you will work out at the right time in the right way. You see, that's gratitude. That's being thankful. That's being appreciative. And we're being appreciative ahead of time. In fact, God says, before you call on me, I will answer. And sometimes we get the answers before we even start to pray. But most of the time, God wants us to pray 
in a way that will expand our faith. And that is that we don't see the answer right away, but we're thanking God before we see it. And then when we see it, oh, then we, our faith is growing and stronger. So overflowing gratitude. And that brings us to praise. You see, when we believe that God is going to answer us, and we're thanking him for the answer, then we can go a step further and praise him and say, Lord, you are so, so um, dependable. You are so strong. You're able to do this. You are so loving that you've already thought of it for me before I even asked for it. And we can go on talking about the different qualities that we see in God that relate to whatever the request is. And when we talk to him about those qualities and those powers that he has, that's praise. And that really makes a big uh, blessing on us and it adds power to our prayers. Now we come to verse 7. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Jesus Christ. Now here it says, then... Now that's a big little word. Then God's wonderful peace will help us. The peace comes only if the, something happens before the then. God's promises are conditional. Just about every promise you can think of in the Bible, there's some kind of a condition with it. Now in this case, the condition is in the previous verse, verse 6. It's when we have saturated prayer throughout the day, we have faith-filled requests that include overflowing gratitude and praise. When, we ha when we're praying with gratitude and praise, then we have the peace. That's when the peace comes. So we fulfill the condition and the peace comes. And then we have understanding. Then we can see the answers developing and we can, we can understand how God works much better. So God's promises are conditional. If we have no prayer for things, then we have no peace. That's this verse 7. In the message paraphrase, it puts it this way for verses 6 and 7. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises, notice the praises, now let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. See, Jesus wants to be at the center, not worry. And when Jesus is there, then we're going to be thanking him, appreciating him, praising him. And it says here, before you know, a sense of God's wholeness. Now this, what is this sense of God's, God's wholeness? We think about people being made whole. But this is about people sensing God's wholeness. Well, look at the next phrase. Everything coming together for good. You see, God's wholeness is God's, we, we use the term sovereignty. That means God is over everything. He has a, his authority is whole. It's over the whole world. It's over the whole universe. And God, can, in that sovereignty, in his ability to, to influence things, influence situations and people and, and to overcome problems, and that sovereignty, that authority God uses to work in our lives to make all the different things, whether they seem good or whether they seem bad to us, but he can take those things and make them work into something good as he pulls it all together. So we see God's wholeness. He has the whole picture in mind for us, not just a little piece of it. That's all we can see. We see little pieces and we get concerned when those little pieces aren't working out the way we think they should. But as we put it in God's hands, he takes all the pieces and he makes them work together for something really good. And it might not just be for us. 
he might be really working something good through our situation for somebody else. Now, that'd be okay, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be okay if God works with somebody else to give them a blessing? Sure, that's good. Well, verse 9, we're going to see this again where he says, who makes everything work together. It sounds a lot like what Paul said in Romans, chapter 8, verse 28, where it says that God can work all things together for good. And so Paul likes this idea. He, he mentions it uh, these several times, and it's something important for us to take into consider, especially when bad things are happening in the world, and it looks like things are going to be really tough for us in one form or another, whether it's with this crisis or another one that's coming or something you've already been through. Uh, we can see, if we keep looking, keep trusting God, and keep putting it in his hands, we can see how he makes it work together for good. Now, verse 8 says, So keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind. And fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him always. Now, this verse I've heard several times referred to in sermons or books or whatever, and it talks about how our world is filled with a lot of selfishness and pride and evil and violence and trouble and um, horrific things. And the encouragement here is to not get caught up with putting our thoughts on all that all the time. Somebody said, if you listen to the news 24 hours a day, you'll go crazy. Well, that's some truth to that. Uh, we want to hear, we've got to hear some good things. We've got to hear some positive things. We've got to get focused on what's real. And what's real is what's lasting. The things of this world aren't lasting. Uh, no matter how good your life is, no matter how much you have of the world's fine things, they are not lasting. Even the millionaire, the billionaire, comes to the end of his life and he can't hold on to it. He can't take it to the grave with him. And so we have to get on track with what is real, which is what lasts forever. And that's faith in God, a changed character, changed creation. We become new creatures in Christ. Other people, we can take them. They'll be going to heaven too, the ones who, who accept God's love and goodness. That, that's what's real. And so he says, get focused on that. Get focused on God's desire and plan and ability and effectiveness in winning people for an eternal kingdom. Now notice here, it says, fasten your thoughts on the every glorious work of God. So don't only get thinking about nice things in this world, about... Uh, good stories or uh, biographies of different people or, you know, things that are that kind of noble and uplifting. Those are good. But he says, let's really fasten our thoughts on what God is doing. Now, God does work through people. That's why some biographies tell us about people who have done things to transform the world in, in benefit of others. And that's part of what God is doing, his glorious work. And then it adds the word praising him always. So we look at what God is doing in creation, in history, in the church, in personal answers to prayer in our own lives, in the testimony of other people and how God has worked for them. We f focus on those things. We fasten our minds on those things. And we then praise him for what we learn from those things. And then that, that helps us to deal with so many of the hard things of life. Let's go to verse 9. Paul says, follow the example of all that we have imparted to you, and the God of peace will be with you in all things. You know, we need peace. There's trouble, there's difficulty, there's worries. We need peace. We need the God of peace to be with us always. And it says that, God can come and be our peace if we're following the right example. Now, Paul was a good example. The people knew him. He worked hard. He, he uh, sacrificed much. 
He did things for the benefit of the others. He was a person of integrity. In so many ways, he was like Jesus. Of course, we see in this earlier in this very chapter that he loved the people. So, the people who he was writing to here, he said, when you follow my example, you'll be on the right track and God of peace will be with you. Well, who's the example to you? Do you have an example in your life? Do you have a good example? Now, that's one of the reasons why we have the Bible, because the Bible pro provides for us many good examples that we can read their lives. The story of Abraham and uh, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Excellent examples. The story of Daniel, David, and especially Jesus and then his disciples. All these good examples. We've got to follow the example. We've got to appreciate the examples. And then things can happen in us. In the message it says, put into practice what you've learned from me. What you heard and saw and realized. So put into practice. We can realize something and never put it into practice. So we lose it. But he says, put it into practice. Do that and God will make, or God who makes everything work together. See, that's what we were talking about before. His ability to make everything work together for the benefit of his people and his, his plans. The God who makes everything work together will work you into his most excellent harmonies. Now, harmonies, I'll use the word plans. God has plans to make things come together. You know, when God designed the world, he designed it with many different systems all inter interwoven. Uh, you have the system of water that, that uh, takes and moves through the different environments. You have the air. You have the soil. You have, of course, animal life and, and uh, bird life and sea life. And all these things are all interconnected and dependent upon one another. And what, what the, the Bible is telling us here, what Paul is saying, is that here God has all these plans that he works out in such beautiful array in our world and in the universe. And God will, will work you into his plans. Now, for us, essentially, God's plan is, is directed especially to helping people. And God wants to do all kinds of things to help people, to, to make things better in their lives, to prepare them for eternity. And God wants to take and work out those beautiful plans to help that growth and that potential. And he wants to put you right into that. He has a plan for your life, a plan to use you, to work with you in ways that will use your interests and your abilities and that will make you fulfilled and joyful like, like nothing else. I've seen it happen in my own life. I've heard the testimony of others and I want to tell you it works. Trust God. It works to trust him. Now, verses 12 and 13, he says, I know what it means to lack. In other words, to be poor. I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance. To be rich, in other words. For I am trained in the secret of overcoming all things, whether in fullness or in hunger. And I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. So Paul says, you know, it's great to be rich, great to be around prosperous people and have lots of things and be able to, uh, to really just have enough to be very happy. But... You know, even when I'm in a situation where I don't really have enough, where things are poor, where things are tight, when things are difficult, and it seems that they're not going to get better. He says, even then, because of what Christ has done and what he's doing in my life, I can handle that. I can face it. I can put it in his hands, and I can endure some difficult things. Now, we don't like their enduring difficult things. We get upset. Some people today are getting very upset at the restrictions because of the virus. And they're acting out in various ways. But Paul
Paul wasn't like that. Paul said, I can handle it. I can be calm in the midst of difficulty. I can let the difficulty happen and move ahead. But it has to be with the power of Christ, he said, because of what Jesus is doing in me. In the message, it says it this way. Whatever I have, whatever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. So whatever I have, in other words, rich or poor, with abundance or in need, and whatever I am, I can make it through anything, like, like the problems we're having in our society today, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. Paul knew who he was. Not all of us know who we are. We go through life sometimes wondering, who in the world am I? Maybe our parents told us, oh, you're nothing. You'll never amount to anything. Now, that's hard to deal with. Maybe a teacher said, oh, you'll never make it. You're not college material. Maybe we had a boss who put us down for this or that. All you do is make mistakes. Or maybe we just grew up going through life, being fairly successful, but not feeling like we really belong, like we really have any significant contribution to make. Paul didn't feel that way. Paul said, I know the one who has made me who I am. Have you met Christ? Have you talked with him? Have you heard his voice speaking to your heart as he has said, I want to put you right into my plans that are working out significant issues for eternity. And I want you to be in on it. When you have heard the voice of Christ, when you've heard the message that the Bible gives us of, of these things, we know who we are. We're his. We're his creation. We're his children. We're his believers. We're his servants. We're the ones he's going to honor for eternity. And when we know that, when we know who we are in all these things, then let the hardships come because God is watching over me. He has a plan. He has not forsaken me. He'll be with me. And he'll take me through this valley of darkness. It makes a difference if we know who we are. Paul said it in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Knowing the truth about God and how he relates to us changes us. It renews our minds, and we have powers we never had before, powers to deal with difficulties and the troubles and trials of life. And I'm talking about things in the home. Things in the home can be the most difficult, the most challenging. But God can help us in the home. He can give us patience in the home. He can give us understanding. He can give us compassion. He can help us see things from the other person's perspective, whether it's our spouse or our children, because we know who we are. We're gods. And we get to see as God sees. We get to enjoy people and see that people are the important thing. And we want to help them. We want to understand them and help them. Verse, verse 14. It says, you... You've so graciously pre provided for my essential needs during this season of difficulty. Now, I don't know if you're in a season of difficulty right now. Of course, it basically everybody is. But some have more difficulty than others. Some are losing their jobs. Some haven't been paid in a long time. Some are uh, risking losing their homes or their cars. And they don't know what they're going to do. They don't see an end in sight particularly. And you're facing a season of difficulty. Now some are not facing that much difficulty. Their job is continuing. They can pay their bills. They even get extra time at home and enjoying the family, doing some things they haven't done before. So where are you in that? I don't know. But this says that Paul had his 
essential needs met graciously by others. If you're in a season of great need, don't be afraid to ask for help. God is blessing other people so that they can share their blessing with you. If someone offers you help, receive it gladly, thankfully. Thank them and thank God. If nobody has offered you help, then pray to the Lord to send you someone who can help. It may be an agency, it may be a church, it may be an individual, it may be a neighbor or a family member. But receive the help. Thank them for the help like Paul did here. Don't be afraid. Don't be too proud. God is ready to use people. They will get a blessing by being a blessing to you. And then when you come into a time when you're no longer in need and you have resources, you can help other people and pass the blessings on. Pass on the joy. So this section here, I'm only going to read a few verses in this last section, but he's talking a lot about the giving of the Philippians, the blessing of being generous. But notice just one thing. We had in verse 14, he says, you have provided for my essential needs. Now notice verse 19. I am convinced that my God will fully satisfy every need you have. For I have seen the abundant riches of glory revealed to me through the anointed one, Jesus Christ. Paul says, I know what this is like. What goes around comes around. And you have been a blessing to me, and now God is going to be a blessing to you. You have met my needs, now God is going to, miss, met, is going to meet your needs. And isn't this what Jesus taught? Jesus said, with the measure that you measure out to others, that's what measure will be given to you. When you sow something, that's what you will reap. Now, is this a good law? This is one of God's laws, that whatever you sow, that which you, that's what you're going to reap. Is that a, a good law, a righteous law? Well, it reveals God's respect for our personal freedom. We get to choose what we're going to sow, just like when we choose what we're going to put in the garden. Some people right now are planting gardens. They're putting in spinach. They're putting in squash or putting in peas or potatoes or tomatoes they get to choose what they're going to plant what they're going to sow and what they sow is what they'll get and we like that we wouldn't want to plant tomatoes and end up getting uh, rutabagas uh, or broccoli if you, especially if you don't like broccoli now I like broccoli but if I didn't like broccoli and I'm planting tomatoes and expecting to get tomatoes it'd be bad to get something different so God is wise and he respects our choice. And if we sow stinginess and we get stinginess back, well, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If we sow generosity and we're helpful and good and cheerful to people and that comes back to us, well, that's, that's good. That's what we've chosen. And God wants us to think things through to make decisions and to move ahead with those decisions. And he is hoping that we'll trust him and his ways, the ways of life, the ways of generosity, the ways of joy. Well, we need to bring this to a close. And verse 20 says, And God our Father will receive all the glory and the honor throughout eternity of eternities. Amen. So when we're thinking about God and when we're praising him and when we're trusting him, we're trusting him to the point where we can be generous and know that he'll take care of us. Then we're going to be praising him for eternity because we know him. We know how good he is and we like to tell others, we like to express it, we like to worship him as the great and good God forever. Now what have we learned today from chapter 4 of Philippians? Well, we've seen something about reward. Reward is the people. For God, it's the people, even for us. People are the reward. We are each other's rewards, and we are God's inheritance. Now, the second thing we learned about is prayer. We learned that we need to pray with gratitude and praise. And when we do that, we are trusting God to be able to work all things together for good. And we thank him before we even see it. And then the third thing is contentment. Contentment. Paul was content whether he had a lot or a little. Why? Because he knew God. 
and he knew he, how, who he was himself in God's plan. And so the, the contentment comes only by knowing the only true God, to know his righteousness, his love, his mercy, his provisions, his transforming grace, his saving power. Do you know him? That's the question. That's the final thought. Do you know the one who provides peace, who provides contentment, who claims you as his reward? Do you know him? Have you gotten to know him? Have you read the Gospels? Have you looked in the Bible? Have you listened to messages about his love and goodness? You see, he's appealing to us. He wants to reach not only our minds, but our hearts. And he's appealing to us today. Today is the day of salvation. We don't know how much time there'll be until Jesus returns. It may be a very short time. We don't know. But things are happening. You can see it. Not just this crisis, but we've had one thing after another. With earthquakes and tornadoes and flooding and terrible fires and the uh, tsunamis. What more can happen before we're going to wake up that these are signs that the end isn't that far away. We have a little time left to get to know God right now, today. And God is inviting you to get close to him now. Will you do it? Take some time today before this day is out. Get alone with God and talk to him. Invite him to show himself to you. Let's pray. Our wonderful Heavenly Father, you are wonderful in every way. Your creation is amazing with all the different parts fitting together with such complexity, but such balance and beauty and how it all works just marvelously from the tiny little atom to the great galaxies. What a creator you are. And then as we look in the Bible and see the history, the history of our world, the history of sin, the history of redemption, what a God you are working in all these situations with all these different people throughout the, the different centuries of time. And now today, hearing our prayers, answering them, and drawing us to yourself, showing us how good you are, how much you love us, and how, as we fit into your plan through faith, through trusting you, knowing you, how our lives can make a difference. We can know who we are in you. So keep on working with us, drawing us to yourself. And Lord, if there's someone listening today who hasn't yet made a decision to put you first in his or her life, Help them to make that decision today before the day is out. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us. It's been a joy to open up the Bible with you once again. And again, we're looking forward to the time when our churches will be open for services and you can come and enjoy us. And I hope you'll turn in to the viewing of the Hope Awakens programs from the It Is Written um, television ministry. You can get it on YouTube or you can go to their website for It Is Written and Hope Awakens. And we have a few more meetings there and you can find the previous meetings that you've missed and enjoy it very much uh, with John Bradshaw teaching the material. Well, God bless you and in every way. Bye for now.